Good morning, everybody, and welcome to one of the first of three sessions in the North Carolina Digital Learning Day. I'm Marty Creech from Winston-Salem Forsyth County Schools, and I'm happy to be um, collaborating today with some folk from Wake County Public School System and Charlotte Mecklenburg uh, School System in our Digital Learning Day. Today is all about collaborating with others and sharing ideas across the state of North Carolina and even across the country. So today I, I'd like for you to, to, to follow along with me um, and just looking at some ideas for personalized learning. Um, don't necessarily have the answers, but there's some things that, that, that I've seen and looked at and, and some things that I would really, really, really want in a personalized classroom. Uh, last week, we we all went to the conference in Ties, and walking along the vendor hall, it seemed as if every single vendor there had the answer for personalized learning. The 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 theme of the conference was uh, personalized IT, personalize it, and um, there is lots and lots of technologies out there that that were the solution to personalizing learning. Um, if you'll follow along with me today, I'm not sure how the today's meet will go, so we'll kind of skip that a little bit um, and hopefully use um, some of the, the features inside of, uh, inside of Google Hangouts on Air. Um, maybe the question and answer when I'm asking you all a question or if you have feedback, please um, feel free to uh, go to the question section up top. And, and ask that question. I'll um, pay attention to that and try to try to uh, hide, I mean, try to uh, answer some of those questions. Our hashtag on Twitter for this, this event is um, hashtag um, NCDL Day. There's a, there's a mistake in my, my slide here. It's NCDL Day. Sorry about that. NCDL Day. Um, for those of you who are following along on Twitter and using that as a back channel. And my... Uh, Hashtag is at NCWOW. So let's look into this thing, personalized learning, um, a little bit deeper. Um, I believe that the, the sessions that we're doing today are personalizing learning because teachers and educators across the nation are able to join in and pick the sessions that they want to learn more about. They can, if they, if they want to be able to pause, go out and search on their own, some ideas of things that people are saying. Uh, this is a great, great way to personalize learning for professionals and whatnot. Um, so I'm really, really excited for, to, to be sharing with this. So personalized learning, it's what kids are hungry for. Uh, we've, we've all seen the fast food um, slogans, have kids, have learning your way right away. But up, but, 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 kids are loving it. And Yo Quiero, personalized learning. So Taco Bell, Burger King, McDonald's do a great job marketing, advertising to kids about what kids want. Maybe not the best thing for them in the world, but but they do a really really great job um, reaching the, the kids and, and and as educators, it'd be great if we would feed the kids 
what they wanted, the curriculum that we wanted to give them, but in a way that they would really enjoy it and not really understand, like they would think that they were having dessert every single day in our classroom. So thinking about personalized learning, this is this is me. I'm Marty Creech again. Um, some days I shirt and tie. Most days I'm sitting here being goofy somewhere or another. But at heart, I absolutely um, and I adore the children in our district. Adore children, and really, really, really love working for the individual student. Um, but. It's kind of funny. Um, on Facebook, just the other day, I took a quiz, and it's one of like I do not get sucked into these quizzes, but this one I did. It says, "Hey, what could your career choice should you have?" And this would be a point where I would ask you to go out there. If I weren't in education, what career choice do you think Facebook would have chosen for me? And just think about shirt and tie sometimes, funny goofy and loving working with children. I was quite surprised when the result was nothing but a, it was indeed a chef. And I really liked the, 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 the uh, description below it. This is a little screen capture from my phone after I took the quiz. Um, it says you're a creative, patient, and meticulous person. I really do not believe that at all. But the last part of that, this it says you are meant to turn basic things into great art, and that's what I think our our teachers do every single day. They take curriculum that kids may or may not be interested in, and they take it into a great and, and make it into a great work of art or whatnot. And that's what we're going to talk about today: is how teachers can indeed make that a an art piece for each individual student. So along with this chef, I'm gonna, if if this education thing doesn't work out with me, for me, everybody who um, joined my, um, my um, today's meet, I mean, everybody who joined my, this, this session today, I plan on inviting you to my restaurant when I open it up. And this restaurant, I'm going to give you three choices. And I want you to think about each individual choice. And you can only choose one of these three choices. I, in my restaurant, am going to serve sushi. That's all that I'm going to serve in my restaurant. And everybody here is going to, boom, serve, eat sushi. No matter whether you like sushi or not, you're going to get it in front of you. Sushi is your choice to get. Sushi all around. And remember, this is on me, so cost is, is nothing. It's on me. My second choice that I'm going to give you is I'm going to set up a buffet. I'm going to have two meats, probably chicken and beef and a couple of vegetables and a roll or so. And you can go down the line and pick and choose which pieces out of this. But you know what? There's going to be two choices of of meats, there's going to be two choices of, of vegetables and one or two rolls. And let's just say, since we're from North Carolina, we're going to have sweet tea and cheer wine at the end that you get to choose. And then your third choice, your third choice would be, I'm going to give you a menu. And in this menu, you can mix and match anything that you want in this menu. You can pick something off the appetizers. You can also um, take one of these seafood dinners down here and you can mix it in and, and add some things to it a la carte. You can even have dessert with this menu. So really quickly for a couple of seconds, think about which of these choices that, that you'd, uh, you'd indeed choose. And we'll... Um, Hang tight for just a second. And in all honesty, I bet because in this in this menu down here, you could choose the chicken or beef and you could choose the sushi. I bet that most of us would choose this menu right here because with this menu right here, you get all three of these and you get to choose how much and when you want to when you want to get it. That's to me is is some scenarios that we have going in school. 
schools now. This sushi, we're giving sushi, or this buffet, we're giving them some choices. But in all honesty, my vision of personalized learning is more like this menu down here where the kids are the, the, the patrons and they're able to choose what they want, when they want it, and the way that they want it medium rare rare whatnot so let's look at these um, scenarios let's look at the sushi scenario in the sushi scenario um that's more like the, the the instruction that we're giving kids already this 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 um desk are in rows this is how i a lot of the classrooms when i was growing up um were the the teacher was in the front of the room teaching their hearts out lecture 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 they were giving every every kid there some food whether the kids wanted or not 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 necessarily saying that but there were some kids including myself that absolutely loved the style of learning when i was that age or whatnot it's a traditional some kids will love it the material that the kid teachers up here uh, teach it away on uh, not always relevant not always relevant and the teacher in this scenario dictates the learning. Some kids in this classroom are left starving. That starving comes out in the the the, the first and foremost thing you see are, are, are sleeping in class. Uh, it might be other misbehaviors uh, that happen acting out in class. And it could also later on in life lead to dropouts and things like this. Direct instruction, while good for some kids, really leaves some kids starving. We can do better. Than that for our kids so next scenario and it's a huge scenario um, where we're moving towards in our district and a lot of districts are going we're starting to differentiate our instruction and teachers are doing a really great job with differentiating instructions <laughs> with differentiating instruction that's more like the buffet where you give students a choice in their process of how they learn and they get a choice in how they want to want, want to share what they've learned uh, we're moving in that, that direction um, daily. Um, this right here is more student directed, more student choice in the product and process. Still yet with this process and with this with differentiated instruction, teachers say, hey, we're going to start the unit on force and motion now. And in two weeks, we'll be done with the unit on force and motion. Pick your projects. Let's do. Let's see what we do. Some kids absolutely love this, and we're reaching more kids this way. But then there are still a few kids that are hungry. Uh, you know what? Didn't really meet my interest. Whatever. There are still a few kids that are starving. Really, really, really um, starving and wanting more and doing more. I believe that with my vision of personalized learning, we can still do better than that. So with personalized learning, that's more of our menu style. And if I had to think about what a classroom, if, if personalized learning were, were confined to four walls, if I had to, to think about personalized learning, I would think that it would be a classroom like something like this down here, where there's not necessarily the teacher's not doing all of the instruction. Um, there are many things going on in this classroom, many different learning centers, many different learning stations. There are kids in the back learn, uh, individually um, uh, reading and working on some, some items. And there are small groups up here at the front where the student is the leader in this classroom. Um, in personalized learning, students' personal interests are met. Students learn in their own learning style. Students choose their pace. Um, there are, is still some direct instruction. The direct instruction doesn't necessarily come from the teacher in front of the classroom. It could come um, from a student. It could come from different video resources come, uh, coming in. The differentiated instruction is still there. It's the, still the same differentiated instruction that we talked about in the previous um, scenario, and, but it's just different scenarios that are, that are presented toward the kids. In personalized learning and with personalized learning, all of our kids' interests are met. So then all of our kids are fed. And then you know what? If the kids wanted to in this, they could even have dessert with personalized learning. So when thinking about designing your classroom for per, to, to be more personal, here are just a few questions that I've come up with. And I'd love for you to, to ask more questions. Like what are, what are more questions? And, and throw those on the Twitter chat if you'd like. Um, when thinking about personalized learning, 
what are the questions we need to ask? I think the very first thing and, and, and that we need to think about, and we really miss the boat on this a lot of times in, in education um, when it comes from policy standpoints and things like that. The very first thing we need to think about is who are our learners? Forget the curriculum, forget um, the demands that we have. We have to know our students because until we know our students and reach them for, for who they are, then it, no amount of curriculum in the world is going to be relevant to them until we know who our learners are. Um, we can we can do this with personal interest surveys, um, just getting to know our kids, doing the first week of school, making sure that we're spending enough time building uh, resonance and um, collaboration. I mean, a resonance and getting just to know who our kids are before we're starting to cram curriculum down their throat. Um, what are the what are their interest needs and preferences? Um, another big question is what will the lessons look like? And 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 last night after a a grueling loss for my wolf pack, I was um, just thinking what um what are these lessons plans going to look like? Because we're we're sitting here now um, and and asking teachers to turn in a, a lesson plan, and they're having to have some type of format for these lesson plans. But when you have this student on this objective and this student on this objective, what are those lesson plans are gonna look, gonna look like? Or are we gonna have preset lesson plans that we're saying this student is on, that this student is working on this module? Lesson plans will look a lot different. The lessons hopefully will look a lot different than just standing up in the front of the classroom um, regurgitating information. What will, your, what will the environment look like? Will it be four walls? Will most of the learning take place in those four walls? Will we intrigue our students to, to take some things and, 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 and do some things outside of the classroom? Will they be collaborating with other folks in your classroom? If, if it is happening in the four walls, what will that um, look like as far as um, the desk arrangements? Um, what will it look like as far as um, areas for students to collaborate? Um, what will it look like for that student that wants to do some individual um, processes with their interpersonal skills? Um, and then what resources do we need? Do we need a four-walled classroom? Do we need a bigger than our typical classroom so that we can add more students together with more teachers and, and let them work together to, to, um, to, to accomplish their um, goals? And then who will support the teachers? Will we get community buy-in? Will we get the, those folks from the community that are experts in science and engineering or uh, the historians in our community to be able to come in and support and, and reach um, our kids at that level um, that they need to be reached? So when thinking about design, those are just some questions that come to mind, and th those are questions that I work with teachers on to just talk about when they, when they, when they first want to look at personalized learning. So with, this, with that said, um, there's two different, in my mind, two different design qualities. We can design personalized learning and we can get the McDonald's version. McDonald's is pretty cheap. Or we can get the, get the Ruth's Chris Steakhouse version. And to me, um, going to Ruth's Chris Steakhouse is pretty much a treat that happens maybe once a year or whatnot. Um, McDonald's, I try not. I try to make that once a year, also. But you know what? If you needed something fast and quick, an easy answer to satisfy that hunger, McDonald's is the answer. Quick answer. Bruce Chris Steakhouse takes a little bit more planning. the 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 food is a little. Um, the food is just a little bit um, of higher quality um, at Roos Chris Steakhouse, and like I said, it's just a just a different experience altogether. Um, if I if I were to ask you, hey, I want to take you to get something to eat, where would you? What would you choose? Probably, and, and if I was paying for it, you'd probably choose this Roos Chris Steakhouse. So I bring these two things up because when when we look at personalized learning, there are huge many 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 companies out there like i said at the beginning who are selling the answer to personalized learning and and let me let me pre preface this before we um we move on to the next slide these companies that i'm going to show on the next slide are are just companies that that sell a product that can help us with personalized learning 
So looking at these companies, there are tons of companies, and I just picked a few of them that, you know what, they could help us in personalized learning. But if we use those individual things and we put a kid in front of a computer with no context, with no personalization, and we just say, hey, click through these assessments. If you don't understand it, watch the video along with it. Um, and don't touch me. Don't work with your, your coworkers. Don't do all that, those type things then we are really kind of missing the boat on personalized learning. There is not one piece of technology out there that we can put a kid on that we can say, hey, we have done personalized learning and we're doing our kids. If we buy one of those pieces of technology, put, it, put our students on it, I think that we are giving them the McDonald's version. Yes, it's fast. Yes, it's easy, but I, it's not personalized learning. And I don't believe that we're getting our kids ready for um, careers that they will succeed in and prosper in later in life. So with that said, the easy part, easy way is to stick a kid in front of a computer, put them in front of one of those programs and let them click away until they achieve mastery. And we'll call it, call it a day and say, we've, we've established personalized learning in our district and we're ready to rock and roll. So if this isn't personalized learning, here are some ideas of, personalized learning that I would like to think about because I don't know if anybody has followed Jamie Oliver through the years, uh, world renowned chef. Uh, I really love his passion for what he does. He um, actually did a small TV show one time, reality TV show, um, going into a school in, in Europe and a school in West Virginia, taking the same budget that the ca school cafeteria was given there he turned their cafeteria from the, the processed food to more natural foods, more healthy foods for the students, and did it for the same exact price as getting the government processed foods that they were used to. The one thing that he had is passion. And again, I don't think one piece of technology out there is going to re going going to give our students and 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 show this passion that a teacher can 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 give um, in my opinion the this is why technology will never ever ever replace a teacher because the teachers that i work with and the teachers that i experience on a daily basis one thing that they have above all other things that that a technology piece doesn't have is passion for their product passion for what they're given passion for what they're doing in life so with that passion, we can take the ordinary and turn it into extraordinary. So how how will this look and what, what, what are some things that we must include in personalized learning? First and foremost, this is all, and I, and I want to reiterate this one more time. When we think about personalized learning, the very first thing we need to think about is an individual student. We can't think about a blanket, many, many, many students all together. We have to start at all times in anything we do in education and think about individual students. And when thinking about this student right here, there and, and going to personalize learning for her, we've got to think about four things. We've got to get data on this student. We've got to have a system um, it, that, that records data, but what, what we, what we we cannot 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 get wrapped up in this data because um, this kid right here is way more the than a, just a plot on a on a graph. She has many other things, and we need to make sure we have systems in place that we can we can check in on her, see how she's doing in social studies and science, math, and not necessarily is she doing all of her homework, yes or no, but making sure that she understands the concept before moving on to another concept and not holding her back in one subject just because she doesn't know uh, the material in another subject. So we've got to have a system that's a little bit different than the system we're getting now, and that would be mastery grading. We've got to give her choice, and we're going to talk about that in just a little bit, but we've got to have a system set in place where students get choice in what they, how they learn and how they show you what they've learned. And then lastly, I think um, we've got to set up pieces for collaboration because there is no reason for our students to learn 
anything if they can't collaborate and work with others because we're not preparing them just to regurgitate information. We've never been preparing people just, we should have never been preparing people just to regurgitate information. We should have always been preparing students to, to uh, obtain that information and be able to present it and work with others to present that information and do something with that information. So with all that said, these are the four big components that I believe we need to, to look at when thinking about personalized learning for an individual student. That gets pretty tough when you have more than one student because then there's, there's one, two, in this scenario, five students and five different pieces of data, five uh, different levels of mastery in science, and then five different levels of mastery in social studies, and the kids are all over the place. There are five different personalities here that we have to choose from, and there are five students that we need to set up scenarios where they can collaborate further. And this is just five. And we have classrooms of 30. And then in some scenarios in middle schools and high school where you have uh, 30 times 4, 120 students you're dealing with a day, this makes personalized learning a huge, huge, huge task to do. But here's why a personalized learning is important. Because I'm sitting here with these kids, and this kid right here is like, what is he saying? I, I speak Spanish. And this kid's thinking about baseball. One kid's way above my grade level, reading level. And this kid right here is celebrating because yesterday she learned how to multiply by fives. Um, all of our kids' interests and, and, and what, what they get are totally different. And if we're, not, if we're not looking at those pieces, then we're kind of missing the mark on personalized learning and really reaching our kids where they are and, and, and really motivating them, engaging them um, to do. So let's look at these four features that I've shared with you um, as the key components. Key components, I think, are data. We've got to have data systems in place that can track mastery level and not just mastery level. Um, remember, we're getting rid of the old grading system. So with getting rid of the old grading system, um, no longer are kids going to stay like, oh, you do your homework tonight, you'll get 100, you'll get this. And um, at the end of the week, if you make a 70 on the test, it doesn't matter, you've done homework and made 100 on it, you're going to get a B out of the class because that's what the average is. But we need a data system that can track, say, hey, do, does he know how to do 4 plus 4? If so, we can move them on, and we need a data system that tracks that progression. Like, he knows how to add double-digit numbers. Let's move him on to some other system. But another piece of data that we've got to always, always, always remember is this student interest data. Um, that's really, really huge. Uh, we've got to have a way of collecting that student interest data and, and really keeping that and rem remembering that each time we prepare um, different lessons and different adventures for our students to go on to. Uh, this student interest could be through surveys. It could be through qualitative data, you're dealing with that student every single day. You you see what they're wearing. You see the bands on their um, shirt. You see whether they're more into skateboarding. You see um, if they're big into basketball. So making sure that we can record all that data just, just to keep the reminder there always to, um, to, um, to, make sure that all of our lessons are, are geared around that particular student. Sorry about that. Next big component is mastery grading. Our grade, and I, and I alluded to this in the last slide, our grading system is antiquated. Uh, we give students like, hey, you participated in class today. That's great. Yes, I do believe in, in, um, in process, in the process of learning um, and, and really complimenting students on the process, but I'll say ultimately at the end of the day, can the kid do it or can he not do it? Uh, we've got to get rid of participation in homework grades. We've got to get rid of quiz grades that, that give kids. Okay, so we've learned this today in class. We're going to take a pop quiz at the end of class. If you don't know it, I just taught it. You're going to flunk the class or whatnot. We've got to get rid of those grades and basically give kids assessments and in the end, we've got to encourage redos and retakes. And those redos and retakes are the um, the final. I mean, they replace that. We don't take averages because in our progression of learning, we've got to encourage those failures so that the kids can look at their mistakes, learn what their mistakes are, not punish them for it, but let, uh, allow them to retake and do those things. Um, 
in class. And ultimately, here's what we really want. Does the student understand the concept? Because I've seen students before come home with the, go home with an A or a B in class, and they really don't understand the concept. But because they've um, achieved and, and, and just because they've participated in class and they've done their homework and um, they work together in a group on a, on a quiz or, or a project, they get that A or B without actually understanding the concept. So mastery grading is, a, is an essential for personalized learning. We've had to set up um, scenarios for collaboration. We've got to set up scenarios for student to teacher collaboration. And some of that might be, um, yes, and, and here's where those computer programs come in come into play. Um, th those computer programs can give us some data, but they, they're not the be all to end all, but that teacher has to take that data to meet the students where they are. And then that collaboration could be one-on-one -on -one conversations. It could be uh, email or uh, text messaging back and forth. Um, some type of communication and collaboration between the teacher and the student that's ongoing personal in the in the in the the way that the student wants to communicate and does communicate we also have to set up scenarios for student to student collaboration that could be centers in your classroom it could be the way that you you arrange your desk in your classroom it could be um, online platforms um, such as a classroom Edmodo that students can ask each other questions, um, things of that nature. It could be um, Google Classrooms, it, many different um, things to set up students to, to student collaboration. But lastly, we also need to be setting up student to the world collaborations. We need to be working with other teachers around the world to set up some collaborations where, where kids can start asking other students. If you're doing studies of Europe, why not have a collaboration with a teacher in Europe um, so that the kids can work on that project together um, and, and do some things. We need to also set up um, scenarios where students are, are, are collaborating with real world folk. If a kid wants to be a bio, if a kid wants to be an engineer, are we setting up those scenarios for, um, for the students uh, to, to be successful um, in that? And then lastly, that last piece is student choice. And I think that this is um, truly, truly important in how students learn and how students um, give information. So this word consumption, is used a lot in technology. We consume material from the internet. We consume information. Um, when I think about consumption and we and I think about the brain, um, there are three major ways that our brain gets information. It's either by seeing, um, hearing, or doing, in my opinion, visual, auditory, and kinesthetic. So a lot of people say, oh, I'm a visual learner, or oh, I'm a kinesthetic learner. Our students and ourselves, we are all three of these things. And, and, and when we set up these different uh, personalized learning experiences for students to consume information, we have to make sure that we're setting up visual, auditory, and kinesthetic so that the students, number one, can choose their strongest modality. But if they don't actually get it in one modality, they can also um, use other ones to, um, to kind of reinforce their concepts. So when we think about using um, setting up these personalized learning experiences, making sure that, that we're hitting all three of these modalities. But then um, that sometimes is the easy part, and sometimes is the easy part in our traditional learning, making sure that we're hitting all three modalities. Sometimes we have a difficult time with the demonstration. And the easiest way to d for a kid to, in our, in our traditional um, setting, for a kid to demonstrate their knowledge is just through a test. But we could do much better. We can we can let kids use their musical intelligences to rap about a concept, to 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 share about force and motion. We can let them use their mathematical logical to to create a flow chart of a, of a process and work. Um, when with when they're doing um, uh, a research paper, why not let them um, do a a reflection on that processing? Maybe even create a video. So there are many different ways to hit. Um, our eight multiple intelligences um, that we must allow kids to choose which of these multiple intelligences they um, they want to 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 do. So that's to me a key component of personalized learning. So to me, um, those four are four biggies for personalized learning, um, in my opinion. So that all sounds fine and fine and dandy, but when it comes down to it. 
you have your, your approach with those kids, those students in your classroom every single day, the task seems surmountable. I've been on the air for about 30 minutes talking about personalized learning, but in reality, the task is strong. Collaborations like the one we're doing today um, are, are, are some of the answers and how to get there. If we were doing, if, if I were really, really using my today's meet, I'd go to today's meet and ask you, what do you think are the first steps in creating um, this personalized learning experience? So uh, my buddy Adam is typing that in now. What do you think the first steps are in creating um, a personalized learning experience? And I'll just give you a few moments to think about it. And if you'd like to, you could, um, you can type that into today's meet. But I want just want to share some of the, some of my thoughts. So what my, when I'm working with teachers and they want to move in this direction, one of the very first things that the easiest thing that you can do to prepare yourself. Um, my friend Brittany last night, um, she <laughs> she shared with me. A, it was a tweet, I think, and she said, um, "Throwing technology into a classroom that's already defunct." Um, is not going to is, is not going to solve the problem. So one of the very first things you can do um, to personalize learning is set rearrange your classroom, set up that classroom in in pods and and have this workspace where kids can get on the floor and learn or they can stand up and learn where they're grouped together. One of the very very first things um, is you can. Um, you can just set up that classroom. Um, I saw that one of the questions that were on the question and answer piece is what are your thoughts for classroom setup using the traditional furniture we already have? And that's a toughie sometimes, um, but, but it can happen with those traditional desks, maybe cluster them in groups of um, six or seven or eight. I've seen a teach, I, I've saw, uh, I saw a teacher one time take her, tr his traditional desk of four, and then um, go to go to Lowe's and buy a piece of um, plywood, cut it up, cut it just the size of the desk, and he turned that traditional desk into a table with seats in it. Um, uh, moving the moving them into a pod, maybe even getting rid of some desk and letting allowing kids to to chill out on the floor, or um, many different things. Um, Google, go to Pinterest and look for ideas on how to arrange a classroom and, and different ideas of, of, of arranging a classroom. But that is a toughie. And in and, 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 and my um, perfect world upon worlds, we would, if you wanted to go in that direction, we would, um, we would just, the, the magic fairy, the magic uh, genie would come in and w grant you the wish of new furniture. But I understand that that's not always the case. Um, I did visit a school recently where the the teacher wrote a to um, a donors choose grant and received every bit of the furniture. It was um, bar stool height um, seats and bar stool bar height tables for the students. And then she had um, little bouncy balls and she had um, many different pieces of furniture and all that was donated through donors shoes. So that's another option um, for you. Um, you can go ahead and, and start personal interest surveys. You can Google online personal interest surveys, or you can just really create, um, create them on your own. What's your favorite movie? What's your favorite sport? What's your, all of those things can be it, it just to get it, getting to know um, your students a little bit better. Um, you can start, next week building a real world project around those interests um once you know what your kids like if it's acc basketball there's tons of math tons of math that can be involved in acc basketball and to turn on some of those kids that, that typically would get turned off turned off that love basketball just throw that make your math problems into acc basketball or ncaa basketball um pieces whatnot and then um, create small groups based on needs. Um, you're getting data back each time you give a quiz. If you know that, that certain groups are struggling with those things, create your small groups and that way you know that when you go to that small group, we need to focus on um, multiplying double digit numbers. Um, and those are just, some, for me, just some small, small steps that we could um, take to personalize learning just a little bit um, more. Um, I'll, I'm back here live with you. I'm done with uh, the, the slideshow portion. If you will, um, in your, in your, um, 
in the question and answer. If you all have any questions or comments that you'd like to share with me, um, I've got a few minutes and I'll be happy to, to at least acknowledge the question. If I can't answer it or, or don't have an idea, we can throw it back out there to, um, to all the other listeners. Um, if not, I surely do appreciate each and every one of you um, rocking and rolling and kicking off North Carolina Digital Learning Day. Please understand um, that if you will go into my today's meet and there's a link on there. It's bit.ly slash NCDL Day Survey. Um, and in that, and I'll flip over really quickly there because there's a few other things that I want to share with you. Um, so in that today's meet, you've got the bit.ly right here, bit.ly slash NCDL day survey. If you'll go there and just to click on that survey and give, give us some feedback about this session and the other sessions um, from today. And mentioning of the other sessions, if you haven't been to the North Carolina Digital Day, digital learning day .weebly.com, there's a schedule out here and there are great people that are presenting um, later on. And all of the things that I've noticed on here are pieces that can that can help you make that classroom more personalized. Um, differentiation using Google Forms, classroom management techniques in a technology rich environment. There are many things going on. Um, the next one starts at nine o'clock and the last one starts today at three o'clock. So um, please, please, please um, share with your colleagues. Um, share with your friends uh, that if they missed out today, they can come to this schedule also and hear the archive links to the presentations for today. So mine would be right here and everybody else's um, will be there today. Thank you all so much for, for joining me today. I really did appreciate it and have a great day. <laughs> Uh, I did.